I am actually going to stay down on the floor this morning, um, sort of as a little bit of a visual, kind of a visual reminder, a visual reinforcement of some of the things that we're going to be talking about and that we're looking at this morning in our series, Membership Matters. So this is not sort of a, this is not something that I'm planning on doing on a regular basis. It's just, I think this is, as we get into it, you'll kind of understand and realize just why this might be valuable, why this image of me being down here might actually play into it and be helpful. Um, We are uh, following the direction in the book, I Am a Church Member, which we've also been going through on Sunday nights with our Membership 201 class. That doesn't mean, however, even though I picked the book out and made this selection, it doesn't mean that I have to like everything that comes up. In fact, actually, today is an example of something that I would say it's good, it needs to be said, it needs to be heard, it needs to be dealt with, but it's not exactly the most comfortable thing for me to deal with and to talk about. We've been spending the um, past couple of weeks looking at what exactly it means to be a church member, a member of a local congregation, the local body of Christ. Admittedly, I was really wanting somebody else to preach this Sunday. I really didn't want to do this, but I had a couple of people, a number of people, some ministers, some friends, um, who kept saying, no, you know what, you, Jason, you're the one, you're probably the best person to talk about this stuff. And so I kind of do this, in many ways, kind of reluctantly, um, talking about what we're talking about this morning. This is probably the most awkward and uncomfortable you'll ever see me on a Sunday morning, um, ever. So we're just going to get this out of the way early on and be done with it. And I'm never going to come back to this ever again because I just don't like feeling the way I'm feeling right now. Um, This morning, we're looking at the importance of praying for our church leaders, which is why where the awkwardness and the uncomfortability for me comes from. In some ways, it feels a little bit like I'm standing in front of you, um, talking at you, preaching at you for something for my own benefit, and that's just not something I like doing. I really don't like being in that, in that kind of a position, the position of just being the center of attention, having everybody look at me. I know it sounds weird. I'm up every Sunday. Of course, I've always got your attention, but it's still kind of a weird place for me to be. You see, when Michelle and I, when we approached the end of seminary, we had a lot of conversations about, you know, what sort of church did we feel like God was calling us to? What sort of ministry, and what was that going to look like? What was our role going to be? How are we going to conduct ourselves? And, and one of the things we talked about, one of the things we settled on was this idea that for us, our first priority in any church is first and foremost just to be church members, right along with all of you, which is the big reason why I'm down here on the floor on the same level as you guys. That is where our first priority lies. Our second priority then, or sort of the second level to that, would be me as an elder. Me serving right alongside with the other elders and with the other council members. And third, lastly, would be that I just happen to be the church member who gets to stand up in front every Sunday and really does get to stand up in front and gets the opportunity to open God's word, to talk about it, to share it, to talk about the ways that it intersects with life and what God is doing and how this all works out in our church life and in our everyday life lives. And that really is an opportunity. I love doing it. But first and foremost, I'm really just another church member. I'm really just one of you. Really just continuing to strive and work and figure out and understand what God has called me to. We knew going into ministry that this was not something that anybody does. Somebody doesn't go into ministry to get rich. You don't go into ministry for fame. You don't go into ministry for attention, to get popular and to write tons of books and everything like that. We knew that going in. Some kind of luck out, you might say it, and that's what ends up happening. But, you know, I, I remember, but most, most, most do not ever actually see that role or see that sort of attention come to them in ministry. You don't go into ministry because you want the attention. I remember during orientation week, my very first week in seminary, my very first day on a seminary campus. I remember during orientation week, I was sitting in a classroom full of a whole bunch of other new students, and we're sitting there, and we're kind of, we're, we're being given all this information about what it's like and what seminary life is like. And um, um, uh, one of the professors, Dr. Gary Brashears, who's, um, well, Google him, you'll find out his name is pretty popular in theology circles, actually. Gary Brashears, he, he was sitting in front of the class, and he spoke to us, and he said, look around. 50% of you, for whatever reason, are not going to graduate. 50% of you are not going to graduate. And the reasons are all over the map. Then he said, within five years, another 50% of you 
aren't even going to be in ministry anymore. In your first five years of ministry, you're not going to make it. So what we were looking at is out of all of those, probably 120, 150 people sitting in that classroom, in that forum room, and probably 25 of us were actually going to make it in ministry beyond our first five years. Our denomination's track record is a little bit better, thankfully. We have a little bit more of a, uh, uh, a uh, kind of an assessment process that we go through to get to this point. I mean, it's a little bit better, but it's not a whole lot better. In fact, when I transferred to Calvin Seminary, our, you know, our denominational seminary, there, I only needed two more years. I only had two years left in seminary. And now already from the time I graduated, we had less people in my graduating class than what there was just two years prior to when I went in. People dropped out for various reasons. It's been five years now since I graduated seminary. Five years, probably right now, I think graduation was this week and was this week at a Calvin Sem. And I don't know the exact count, but what I do know is that a number of my peers who I graduated with are not in ministry anymore. Some of them never even got a church to begin with. Some of them started and then dropped out for various reasons. All of this to say, church leadership is hard. It's really, really hard. Put aside the worship wars and debates over budget, the mission um, and vision, the fact that this is a non-profit organization, the church is a non-profit organization being run and staff and, and, and operate and functioning as with a group of volunteers. And, and you know, I mean, put, a, put aside all of these things and ministry might very well be the hardest leadership position that a person could ever go into, or church leadership in general could be the hardest thing that anybody would ever go into. Even if you can make it through the administrative and the relationship stuff, you still have the biblical example of what is required for church leaders. A list that we'll look at in a minute that, frankly, even already this morning, I failed with my son up here making a whole bunch of noise. That in and of itself could disqualify me according to what the Bible talks about. It's a near impossible job and position to be in. This morning we're going to look at the fact that I will pray, we will pray for our church leaders. Let me pray a second one, go to the word. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds that we would hear, that we would be moved, that we would be transformed, that we would be challenged and encouraged by what you have for us. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Apostle Paul never shied away from asking for prayer for himself. He was somebody who was always on a mission, always looked to as sort of the epitome of New Testament leadership, and he was never hesitant to just say flat out, look, I need your prayers. I covet your prayers. You've got to pray for me, because really, that's really what all of this kind of you know, falls and rises on. That's what all of this, this ministry, this mission stuff that I'm doing, all of it without your prayers just simply isn't going to go anywhere. And so he asked for it. He asked his readers for their prayers, and he actually demanded and commanded them to pray for other leaders also. And he does this with the words of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy is where we're going this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I urge then, first of all, that, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. I'm only going to go that far this morning. So this is a passage that's typically used and, you know, used to draw awareness about how important it is that we pray for, um, really, usually, I, you know, political leaders or civic leaders. We usually look at this passage and, and, and say, look, even the Bible commands us to pray even for our political leaders, our city leaders, our civic leaders. It's not just those in the church. It's, it's even for the politicians. But the thing is that Paul is really, he's keeping it pretty broad here in so many ways. He doesn't say just for the kings. He says, pray for kings and all those in authority over you. 
So 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy as a, as a book is very focused on leadership and leadership development. It's sort of like the go-to book when it comes to thinking about leadership. What does biblical leadership look like? What do you do? How does it operate? How does it function? We look at, we find the, um, we find the, uh, the, uh, the expectations and qualifications for elders and deacons in the book of 1 Timothy. And so when it comes to talking about leadership, this is the go-to book. This is where you go to get advice and tips and guidance for how do we, how do we lead the people of God plus as as the people of God, as the body, how do we support our leaders? And Paul begins, he begins all of that talk, all that dialogue about leadership, he begins it right here in 1 Timothy 2, that I urge all peti- that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So do these things for all people but especially your leaders. You see, my saving grace with this, with this message in many ways, my saving grace, you know, for my, in my head at least, is that, you know, I, even though I'm the pastor, this isn't my church. FCF is not my church. I'm not the top dog. Not everything gets run through me and is dependent on what I say is going to happen or what I say is going to, to be or the way things are going to happen or anything like that. It's not my thing, and I'm glad about that. I mean, if you want to get really technical, FCF, really, it, it really, we really belong to Jesus ultimately, but he has entrusted to us the council, the elders and the deacons as the top authority on the local level. You know, I'm, even I am submissive to them. And rightly so. I mean, this is the way it's supposed to be, or the way it should be as, in terms of accountability and checks and balances. Even though I have a more public role than the council, the council, they are my leaders and I pray for them. I also know and have been told by a number of them on more than one occasion very clearly that they pray for me also. They even pray for you. They even pray for each of you. In fact, this past Thursday was one of those examples in which the elders came together to pray in a concerted effort for you and for all the leaders in this church. The point, though, the point, though, is pray. Just pray, pray for one another, but pray also for those in your life who have been put in a position of authority or leadership over you in some way, any way. And Paul actually lists, he actually lists four different ways of prayers or four different types of prayers or, or, or you know, maybe he, he, he lists out, you know, different things that you want to make sure you include in your prayers for the church leaders. Four things to make sure that we cover our bases with petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Now think about your prayer for a second. Think about your prayers for a second, your prayer life. You know, maybe maybe you already do a pretty good job praying, praying regularly for others and for the leaders, you know, the church leaders and civic leaders and everything else. Maybe you already do a pretty good job with that. But what do those prayers look like? You think about that for a second. What do those prayers look like when you pray? What's really kind of going on now? What's sort of in the background? What are you usually praying for? You know, discernment. Discernment's a common topic. It's one that we often pray about. We pray about it, about, we pray about the sermon for, for our leaders and everything right here. You know, and, it, it, it's, you know and, it's, and it's a good thing. We pray that our leaders would seek God's will. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing and a noble thing that needs to be prayed for. But is there a hint underneath your prayers that you really wish some of the leaders here would just simply change the way they see things or do things and come more in line with how you see things and do things? Is there a hint to that underneath your prayers? Lord, please let Pastor Jason realize that we really ought to be doing dot, dot, dot. Or, Lord, be at tonight's council meeting that they would decide to dot, dot, dot. I came to the realization in seminary that I have a difficult time with authority figures. That's just kind of one of my things. It just kind of, it's gotten me into trouble so many times in the past, I can't even count how many times it's gotten me into trouble. There's just something in my personality that makes me just kind of hardwired to automatically just kind of have personal issues and be kind of tense and, and, uh, and just kind of, you know, I just, just kind of constantly fighting and wrestling with people who try to exercise authority over me. And it's not just my bosses, it's not just my pastors or my counsel, it's not just, you know, it, it, it even extends even to my family. There's even been times where I've been really kind of on edge and not 
in a really good spot, even with my own parents because of this, because I'll sit here and they'll try and tell me to do something. My dad could never ground me because I was always going to sneak out at night and go and do what I wanted to do. And then I get grounded for even longer. I just couldn't, I just, for whatever reason, I just, I couldn't find it in me. And I still, you know, kind of wrestle with this from time to time to really just completely submit to those who God has put in those authority positions over me. And after... I don't know, countless arguments um, with teachers and with profs, as well as being confronted at one point about my crummy attitude, you know, directly about, you know, directly toward my parents, I started to realize that the problem is probably not with them, and it's probably with me. And I repented of that. I sought forgiveness. I repented of the fact that I had a crummy attitude. I repented of the fact that I was always walking around with my fists up, ready to fight and ready to resist anybody and everybody who tried to get me to do something. And I repented of that. I asked for forgiveness. And I went to those people who I had argued with and who I had tension with, and I reconciled with them. I had conversations with them, and I apologized to them for the things that I was doing. Yes, there is kind of some overlap between, you know, what we're talking about last week, too. I was always about my own preferences, my own desires, my own way of doing things. And sometimes things got really ugly. And oftentimes I got in a lot of trouble. And it messed things up. I began to pray for them, for my leaders. I began to pray that God would actually change my heart first and change my attitude, and that I would start to see them the way that God sees them. And I began to submit, when appropriate, to seek understanding, and, felt, and whenever I felt the urge to resist and to fight. Four ways that Paul talks about praying, or four things to include in your prayers. And the first one is petitions. Petitions, the Greek word deasis. And this is specific prayers. This refers to specific prayers for concrete situations. Specific prayers for concrete situations. This is like what we just did a few minutes ago with our congregational prayer when we think about prayer requests. You know, what are some specific things that we can be praying for, specific needs that God wants us that are coming our way, that God would say, lift these things up and put them on God's plate. Specific ways that we can be praying about and remembering our leaders. And then Paul says, through prayers, which is kind of a funny thing to say because we're thinking, well, we're talking about praying for our leaders, so why would he feel the need to actually mention prayers? And this is the word prasuche. Prasuche. And it's re- it actually refers to this state of humility or adoration or worship. See, we talk so often about, you know, just simply, you know, pray. We're going to pray to God. We're going to pray for somebody else and everything like that. But what are we actually doing in the act of prayer? And what's actually going on there is this idea when you pray, at least when you pray to God, we'll start there. When you pray to God, there's actually this idea of posture. This is where I wish I was up higher. This posture where you actually physically go down on your knees and bow down and humble yourself and submit yourself to God's authority. To God's rule. And the idea that Paul is going with here is that we pray for our leaders. We take on that posture of humility before our leaders in the same way that we take on that posture of humility before God. Intercession. Intercession. And tuxus. It's kind of a fun one. And tuxus. Suggests a need that someone cannot overcome by themselves. This goes beyond just simply the standard prayer request, but when you look at a person, you look at something that's going on in their life, they have a need that they just simply can't work hard enough at or buckle down or, or strive harder or read more or look for the certain, you know, pull the certain plugs or whatever it is, you know, I mean, pull the certain strings and things like that and make something happen. They actually are incapable of doing something by themselves and they need the support. They need somebody to come alongside of them, beside them, and hold them up and support them. And that's what's going on with intercession. You are coming alongside your leaders and you are physically holding them up in many ways. Thanksgiving. Eucharistia. Eucharistia. It took me forever to get that sound down, by the way. It, 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 years and years to get that worked out. 
to give thanks, to be thankful. So it's not just a matter of just praying for your leaders that they would have the support they need and they would have the, everything that they need to do their job well, but you actually thank God for them and their role in your life because they are a blessing from God. See, when our tendency is to pray for our leaders in ways that benefit us and put our preferences and desires first, see, each of these words, these four words, they push us to focus on God and the other people around us, the other person. And in praying this way, much like what what happened with me in seminary, we often tend to soften and find it easier to submit and to build up our leaders in the way that God wants us and desires and has intended for us and for the body to work. Pray for the kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Pray for our kings and for all those in authority, for everyone around us. You know, back in 2008, back in 2008, when President Obama was first elected, I remember, I remember hearing a number of conservative, you know, kind of talk show hosts and personalities and things like that that would make comments along the lines of saying, you know what, I really wish, I really hope that Obama fails as a president. I really hope that Obama fails as a president. And that was largely political driven, but politics aside, I've always found a comment like that really pretty baffling because I think of comments like that and I wonder, why would you want the president to fail? Despite what party is at, despite how much you might agree with them or disagree with them, why would you want him to fail? Because if the president fails, it's going to have a trickle-down effect, and it's going to affect you, and not necessarily in a good way. It's going to have an impact on everything that happens. And see, Paul essentially, I think Paul essentially says the same thing here in 1 Timothy. He says, pray for your leaders, political, workplace, and church, because they have the ability to make your life peaceful and quiet and enjoyable. They also have the ability to make you miserable. And according to Paul in verse 3, according to Paul in verse 3, God is pleased when our life is good. He's pleased about has having a quiet and peaceful life. Having a peaceful life is actually part of God's desire and will for us. Now, initially, that's kind of, that might make some of you kind of, you know, kind of, eh, I'm not so sure about that. That doesn't sound right. Does God actually want me to be happy? Is that what's going on? And we're not talking about, you know, um, I don't know, um, prosperity gospel and health and wealth and all this kind of stuff. That's not exactly what's going on here. But there is a sense that when God desires for us, he does desire what is good. He does desire that we do enjoy and get fulfillment out of the life that he has given us. He doesn't put us here. He didn't put us here. And he doesn't bring things into our life to torture us and make us miserable. That's the result of sin. His desire is that we will actually get a benefit and enjoy life so that we can really, so we can worship him him all the more. And this is not just the New Testament thing either. You know, it's um, um, Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Let me actually, let me read Psalm 1 here a second for you. Psalm 1 became one of my favorite psalms in seminary. Um, Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but who delights but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Blessed is the one. Now the interesting thing about this is that the Hebrew underneath blessed that we translate blessed, and we always translate as blessed because it sounds like a more holy, godly word to use to talk about being blessed. But that word, that Hebrew word there, can just as easily be translated as happy. And if you were to pick up a Jewish translation, a Jewish-English translation of the Old Testament, they actually, Jews actually put that word happy in there where we have the word blessed. So when they open up Psalm 1, the first thing that they read is, happy is the one, or happy is the man, happy is the person who delights in the Lord. This has always been around. God actually wants us to enjoy life because that's his way of blessing us. And so when we go back here to talking, about, to talking about leadership and praying for our leaders, and we see the same kind of thing coming out in 1 Timothy 2, that you pray for your leaders because they have the ability to give you a quiet and peaceful life. Paul is speaking in a long line 
of tradition, of Jewish Christian tradition. John Maxwell, author of more leadership books than I could possibly count, he wrote that everything rises and falls on leadership. And as members of the local body of Christ, we have a call to serve in a variety of capacities. That's what we've been talking about. I mean, at the most basic level is accepting our part, and, you know, our role, our place as a body part in the body. And we serve one another by seeking unity and practicing humility and servanthood toward those around us, living as Jesus lived. We called that posture last week. And we are now being challenged to actively pray for our leaders, for me, for the members of the council, for our various ministry leaders and, and, and throughout the church. Because much like each of us being a functional and unifying members without prayer of the sort that Paul is talking about in 1 Timothy 2, FCF will not thrive. More importantly, the gospel will be missed. As Paul says in verse 4, God, God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants the gospel proclaimed. He wants truth to be known, the truth, not any truth, the truth, the truth that the world is a messed up place, drastically different from what God originally intended when he created it. The truth that though, that though human beings were created, though we were created perfect and in God's image and for the explicit purpose of having a relationship with him, we have become completely tainted by sin and therefore separated from God. The truth that God, out of his great love for you and for me, became flesh in the person of Jesus of Nazareth and sacrificed himself on the cross just outside of Jerusalem. The truth that despite every ounce of our brains telling us it's impossible, that on the third day this Jesus rose again from the dead. The truth that John 3.16 says that whoever will believe in him, whoever will believe this message, this gospel, whoever will believe this will not perish but have everlasting life. According to Paul, much of this is dependent upon the leadership of the men and women God calls to lead. They used to have issues with those in authority over me. I used to have big issues with them. But I've since come to see these people as a gift from God, a gift that God has brought into my life. And I pray on their behalf, and I thank God daily for them. And I ask God that, that he would continue to bring these people, people like you, into my life so that I will continue to grow and become the leader that he has intended me to be. I never want to get comfortable. I always want you to make me uncomfortable so that I continue to grow. I could bore you with personal prayer requests. I could do that. You saw one this morning. It's a big one. <laughs> I think 1 Timothy 3 actually provides a pretty good list. I'm going to read 1 Timothy 3 a second. This, when it comes to how to pray for your leaders, this is the guide, that scripture that God gives us in his word. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer or an elder desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not, not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his, his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing 
and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. In a couple weeks, we're going to be officially installing new elders and deacons. And over the next few weeks, as a personal plea and really on behalf of every council member now in the past and especially in the future, I'm asking that you spend time over the next couple weeks reading through that list in 1 Timothy 3. Pray specifically for those things that are listed there in relation to our leadership. So you don't have to get very far into that list before you start to realize that really it's a pretty impossible list. I think probably the first point that an elder or an overseer must be above reproach right there is going to probably disqualify everyone. And then the list just keeps going from there. It's a hard list to live up to. And yet this is what I and John and Mike and Graham and Wendy and Arlene and Kara and Len and Matt and Joel and our new council members, Rod and Shelly and Jenny, this is the list that they are being held to and that we are being held to. Let me be clear. We need your prayers. We need your petitions. We need your intercessions and we need your thanksgivings. We need your prayers. I will pray for my church leadership. I will lift them up as often as I possibly can so that they will fix their eyes upon Jesus and constantly seek discernment and wisdom to lead me, to lead the church in God's mission in the world. I will pray for my church leaders. Let's pray.